This is a read aloud for the Unit 3 test. Passage 1, The Open Window by H. H. Monroe, otherwise known, otherwise known as Saki. The Open Window My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttell, said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Nuttell endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there, some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know many of the people round here? asked the niece, when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. My sister was staying here, at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt, pursued the self-possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow, in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open. On an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of the year, said Frampton. But has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favourite snipe-shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here, the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back one day. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? As he always did, to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke it off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room 
with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton, it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who laboured under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No? said Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk, I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall said Mrs. Sappleton, could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance at short notice was her speciality. Question one. How does the conversation between Frampton and Mrs. Sappleton affect the plot? A. Frampton learns during their conversation that Mrs. Sappleton is insane 
resolving the conflict of the story. B. Frampton believes that Mrs. Sappleton's husband and family are dead, while Mrs. Sappleton speaks as though they are alive. This builds tension. C. Frampton, after waiting all day to speak with Mrs. Sappleton, is unable to speak to her. This marks the climax of the story. Question 2. How does Frampton advance the plot of the story, The Open Window? A. He believes the young lady's story about her aunt's tragedy. B. He thinks the weather is warm for October. C. He doesn't know if Mrs. Sappleton is married or widowed. Question 3. Which line from the story foreshadows the trick the niece will play? A. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. B. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall, said a very self-possessed young lady of 15. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. C. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt? pursued the self-possessed self young lady. Question 4. Read these sentences from The Open Window. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. Which phrase from these sentences contributes most to the sense of surprise? A. Dazed horror in her eyes. B. Staring out through the open window. C. Looked in the same direction. Passage 2. Excerpt from The Cast of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is well known for writing short stories with a macabre or ghastly theme. In this story, the narrator, Montressor, believes Fortunato has spoken ill of him. Montressor has plotted revenge and lured Fortunato into his cellar with the promise of a taste of a very special type of wine called Amontillado. Fortunato is having a coughing fit at the beginning of this excerpt. Montressor pretends to be worried about him, but he really wants revenge. friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be able, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is no chasing. Enough, he said. A cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, well, I replied. And indeed, I have no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draught of this mail will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the bed that revolves around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These walls, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous man. I forget your arms. A huge human foot door in a field asher. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nim me impugna la chasit. No one insults me with impunity. Good, he said. The wine 
sparkled in his eyes, and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The mole, I said, see, it increases. It hangs like a moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back here. It is too late. Your cough, it is nothing, he said. Let us go on. him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? Huh? You are not of the Mason. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my cloak. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed <coughs> to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak, and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our torches rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall, thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry to the depths of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Here is the Amontillado. As for the chase, here's an ignorance interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the mold. Indeed, it is fair and damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No. Then I must positively leave you. Then I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! shouted my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance to the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of my masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low, moaning cry from the depth of the reef.
he says. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second to you, and the third, and the fourth. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction. I ceased my labors, and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel, and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the torch over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume, and in strength I did this, and the clamor grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position, but now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> Very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. We shall have many a rich laugh about it at the Palazzo. <laughs> Over a <our> wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, yes, the Amontillado. But it is it not getting late? <clears throat> Will they not be waiting us at the Palazzo? <clears throat> the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be Question five. How does Fortunato advance the plot of the cast of Amontillado? A. He eagerly follows Montresor into the crypt. B. He leans on Montresor's arm as they walk. C. He plasters a wall between himself and the outside world. Question six. Which line from the story reveals Montressor's true intentions in his dealings with Fortunato? A. Come, I said with decision, we will go back. Your health is precious. B. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. C. But to these words I hearken in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. 
Question seven. How does the author create a sense of tension? A, the author uses dialogue to slow the pace. B, the author uses flashback to reveal secrets about the main characters. C, the author intentionally withholds information from readers, leaving them in the dark about the characters' motivations. Question eight. Read these sentences from the cast of Amontillado. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. Which literary technique is used in these sentences? A. Pacing. B. Withholding information. C. Foreshadowing. Question 9. Why does the author use the technique from the previous question? A. To create a humorous tone. B. To show realism. C. To build suspense. Question 10. Read these sentences from the cast of Amontillado. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was su succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. How does the author create surprise in these sentences? But A. By foreshadowing. B. By revealing shocking information. C. By withholding information. Passage 3. Uses and Abuses of the Umbrella by Gabriel Garcia Marquez Translated by Mark Schaefer. Uses and Abuses of the Umbrella by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Translated by Mark Schaefer, page 102. If one were to produce a careful statistical tabulation of the men whose umbrellas, one would determine that when the rains begin, the umbrellas disappear. It's only natural. The umbrella is too fine, too delicate and lovely an article for water to be allowed to ruin it. The umbrella, though we are led to believe otherwise, was not made for the rain. It was made to be carried on the arm like an enormous ornamental bat and to allow one the opportunity to put on British airs, as the atmospheric conditions demanded. If one were to research the history of the umbrella, one would discover that it was created with a purpose far different from that which formal umbrellas wish to attribute to it. Those gentlemen who mistakenly take their umbrellas to the street when it looks like rain, unaware that they are exposing their precious devices to a washing that never figured into their plan. Cork hats and newspapers of more than eight pages were invented for the rain. Furthermore, before the cork hat and the newspaper of more than eight pages, rain had been invented for just this purpose, to fall on the happy pedestrian who has no reason in the world not to enjoy a shower of pure water from the heavens, still the best prevention against baldness ever invented. The reduction in umbrellas during the rainy season demonstrates that there are still a goodly number of gentlemen who know what this black, molded tree with metal branches is for, a device invented by someone who grew desperate in the face of the... Page 103. Compelling concept of being unable to fold up a bush and take it for a stroll, dangling from his arm. An intelligent woman once said, The umbrella is an article proper to the desk. And so it is, and it is well that 
it is so, for it presumes that next to every desk there ought to be a coat rack and, hanging on the coat rack, an umbrella, a dry one, however. For a wet umbrella is an accident, a barbarism, a spelling mistake that must be spread open in a corner until it is fully corrected and has become a true umbrella once again. An item to be carried in the street, to be used to startle friends and, in the worst cases, to fend off one's creditors. Question 11. Read these sentences from Uses and Abuses of the Umbrella. The umbrella, though we are led to believe otherwise, was not made for the rain. It was made to be carried on the arm like an enormous ornamental bat and to allow one the opportunity to put on British airs as the atmospheric conditions demanded. What effect does the phrase to put on British airs have on the meaning of this passage. A. It implies that British people use the umbrella as a prop to show social class instead of for its practical purpose. B. It demonstrates the importance of the umbrella. C. It proves that umbrellas should be used as props or decorations and not used for the rain. Question 12. How does the phrase, a wet umbrella is an accident, a bar barbarism, contribute to the author's voice? A. It adds a touch of irony. B. It creates a sense of clarity. C. It offers an attitude of obligation. Question 13. Read these sentences from Uses and Abuses of the Umbrella. The reduction in umbrellas during the rainy season demonstrates that there are still a goodly number of gentlemen who know what this black molded tree with metal branches is for, a device invented by someone who grew desperate in the face of the compelling concept of being unable to fold up a bush and take it for a stroll dangling from his arm. Which phrase is a humorous attempt at making fun of umbrellas? A. Device invented by someone. B. Goodly number of gentlemen. C. To fold up a bush and take it for a stroll. Question 14. Read this sentence from Uses and Abuses of the Umbrella. If one were to research the history of the umbrella, one would discover that it was created with a purpose far different from that which formal umbrellists which wish to attribute to it. Those gentlemen who mistakenly take their umbrellas to the street when it looks like rain, unaware that they are exposing their precious devices to a washing that never figured into their plan. How does the word umbrellist contribute to this passage? A. It makes the tone in the passage more casual. B. It emphasizes how the narrator feels about people who use umbrellas. C. It demonstrates the seriousness of the writing piece. Passage 4. Excerpt from The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. But the animal, General Zaroff. Oh, said the general, it supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt, and I never grow bored now, for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed in his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? I can't believe you are serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. 
Hunting? Good God, General Zaroff. What you speak of is murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seem to be harbors romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war did not make me condone cold blood and murder, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. How extraordinarily droll you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive and, if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff box in a limousine. Ah, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You have a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you. I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me, said the general, quite unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? Life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and, if needs be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gift? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships. Baskers. Blacks. Chinese. Whites. Mongrels. A thoroughbred horse or hound is worth more than a score of them. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely, said the general. That is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason, after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? The general's left eyelid fluttered down in a wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high sea sends them to me. Sometimes, when providence is not so kind, I help providence a bit. Come. Question 15. What does the interaction between the men reveal about Z Zaroff's attitude towards Rainsford? Rainsford. A. He thinks of Rainsford as a worthy opponent. B. He believes Rainsford's view, views of life and death are insincere. C. He, re he views Rainsford's moral stance as misguided and uninformed. Question 16. How does Zaroff's attitude advance the plot of this passage? A. Since Zaroff sees Rainsford as sentimental, he misjudges him as an opponent. B. Because Zaroff is intelligent, he tries to be a master of men. C. Since Zaroff enjoys conversation with Rainsford, he uses it to analyze his enemy. Question 17. What does the interaction between the men reveal about Rainsford's attitude toward Zaroff? A. He is afraid of Zaroff's lack of self-control. B. He questions Zaroff's hunting skills. C. He believes Zaroff's behavior is wrong. Question 18. I would like some completion points for taking this test. Answer A, yes. Good luck on this test.